Hello and welcome everybody to That Show with Mahi. My name is Stephen May and today I am very, very lucky to be speaking to Felicity Jurd from Pitch, Pause, Pace. Felicity, welcome and thank you very much for joining me. Oh, it's an honour. Seriously, Stephen, you're amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Now, the reason why I have you on, um, well, I have everyone on is because I have a, I've had a connection with you in some shape or form. Um, I'll never forget doing uh, my first voice class with you. And it's not that I've never done a voice class before or other teachers were bad, but I remember I got up and I had to say part of a monologue and it was fine. Like I thought it was good. And you just gave me this one note and it was about a tongue exercise about doing the fox is fast, is very, very fast. The fox is quick, very, very quick. And it was different tongue placements. And then all of a sudden the text came out of my mouth like I have never felt before and I just remember looking and going I need this woman in my life she needs to be a coach um, how in one moment can you pick out something that others may not have or how have you made me listen for the first time in this particular way so I thank you for that moment of gold because I use it every time before I go on stage or I find a moment that I'm like oh I'm stuck what is that remember what Felicity said so I guess my question to you is, um, as a voice teacher, how have you found connecting with each particular actor in a, such a, a beautiful way that it, it is so personal? It's not just a blanket, okay, this is what you should do as a voice exercise. Oh, what a beautiful question. First of all, I have to give credit for that exercise to a girlfriend of mine who she doesn't like social media or anything, but, but it, the exercise was really derivative of hers. I've adapted it and I choose when I use it, but she actually taught it to me. So thank you very much. You know who you are. Um, if she happens to be on social media by one chance. <laughs> um, so it's not, and, and that's actually an important thing for me to raise is that most of my work is derivative. And I think most voice teachers, um, well, we have to be derivative, don't we? I mean, even movement teachers, for a long time I was a movement teacher before I was a voice teacher, and even that is derivative. You're always learning an exercise from someone and then appropriating it, and I think that's, what do they say? Um, you know, good scholarship is the appropriation of many sources, um, you know, rather than obviously um, just, uh, you know, ripping off other people's work. So I think... Look, I mean, I when I heard you do that, and it's funny because I, I didn't know what your gold moment was when you said that you had a gold moment. I mean, I remembered another one as well um, around, and it was around that tongue placement. Sometimes, I, I guess it's a very hard question for me to answer, but if I'm really honest, if I can be really honest, it might sound a bit woo-woo, but I sometimes just know, um, and I don't know <laughs> why that is. I don't know why that is. I'd love to give credit to somebody or something or, you know, um, I, I sometimes know uh, and, I, and I, it feels a bit silly saying that and I feel a bit vulnerable sharing that, but I sometimes just know. Um, and it, I, I tell you what it is. I think it does in part come from my training as a dance teacher and as a dancer. I spent a lot of time like four to six hours a day dancing, sadly, for my waistline. That's no longer the case, but I must get back into it. The, um, but, <laughs> but, um, but in terms of the discipline of it and in terms of understanding anatomy, because voice is physical. And so what has been the most amazing thing for me as a revelation as a voice artist is realising that when I find the right placement for a character, it's actually in my body and the voice follows. And if you think about breathing, the body moves first, the breath comes in, then the voice. So the body is always first and then the voice. Yeah, Does right. Does that make sense? I was listening to um, Howard Fine talk today with um, Casting Networks and it was an hour long sort of session. And he said, a lot of people approach it, oh, how am I going to do that? How, how does this work? How does that happen? Instead of thinking, why? Why, why is that happening? Why, what propels me to, to say those words, not how am I going to say it? So why am I doing something? And that intention there comes from a more natural place and you stop thinking about your breath, you stop thinking about placement and it really drives like, I, and the words come out naturally. Instead of putting that, that moment on top of it first, you're already blocked. Absolutely. And I, but I think it's hard because I think as actors, different actors work outside in and different actors work inside out. And so what you're describing is that very organic process of having a response and an active um, 
an, an, an active response in the body that, that shifts and shapes in, in terms of your objective and your character work. Um, and I really believe in that, but I also believe that an actor has to develop their craft and develop a sort of a, a muscularity in the voice um, and openness in the voice and, and, and active, just like how, you know, you're amazing with your physicality and with your fitness, you know, that just doesn't happen by doing, you know, six days in a row at the gym and going, right, I did it. It's yeah. like, okay, yeah, you did six days. Fantastic. Of course, that's amazing. But you couldn't achieve, that. like, it's about consistency. Yeah. And so as much as that moment is true, that but what we do is we prepare for that moment. And it's a yeah. little bit like what Oprah talks about, I suppose, which is, you know, luck is really opportunity and timing, isn't it? It's like, it's not, it's never, it is a bit luck, but it's also not. So that moment of genius that a lot of those really amazing, amazing actors that you can think about on stage, those genius moments only ever happen because the actor was ready with the craft in the first place to have their body be responsive enough in that moment. Yeah. And so that's really what I teach. What I teach is um, very much like a personal trainer is inspiring people to do the work, to do the physical work for the voice so that the voice is ready for them and available to them so that their acting can actually live. Absolutely. Um, one thing as a, I came from a music theatre background with WAPA and we did have voice classes, but I didn't understand the importance of speaking, like just a spoken voice class, because I think I wake up every day and I speak, we communicate on the phone. Um, but then when it comes to acting, there seems, seems to be this kind of what I found for myself, there was a block or I've seen in other people. It's like, we can sing and we can do it. And this is not, a, not everybody, but what I've found has been so unlocking and uh, what I've achieved by doing voice classes and repeating exercises over and over again, is that it unlocks that emotion or unlocks something else. Do you see a difference in someone that doesn't do a voice class, but also, you know, they also have a singing background, they might fall into a bit of a pattern of a speaking singer, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess, I, I think it's different for different people. You know, some people are able to integrate their knowledge better. Um, so I teach in a lot of the acting programs at different acting schools and, and what I've noticed is, and sometimes I work with musical theatre as well, obviously not as a, I'm not a singing coach, but I do work with a lot of singers. And one of the things I, um, I notice is that some people are better at integrating that knowledge. And what I mean by that is if we see them as separate entities, and they are a little bit, obviously, yeah. but there is also an overlap. If you think about it, you know, acting and movement go hand in hand. You know, a really good actor will have command of their movement. A really good actor will also have command of their voice. You know, a really good dancer will have command of their body, but that doesn't necessarily make them a good actor and so on and so forth. A really good singer will have really good command of their voice, but not always great diction. You know, yeah. sometimes singers arrive at singing. You probably met a lot of singers who started into singing because it was almost a speech therapy. They might've had a speech impediment. And so sometimes I work with singers who have actually had an unresolved speech impediment for a really long time but yeah. they can mask in their singing and the singing gave them their strength and their confidence to be able to be in front of an audience. Um, so that's very common with people to learn singing and music as a sort of almost a therapy, but then they end up being gifted at it. And, um, and then there's also the other side of it, which is that, um, that a lot of actors who don't sing and who are probably never going to be singers for a living probably should learn how to sing because it does actually improve the spoken voice. So it's that overlap that I was talking about. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, so I know that you do so many different things. Um, you spoke before about coming from a dance background. Um, you're a voice teacher. Uh, you're also a working actor and working voice, um, voiceover artist. Now, I don't know how you fit all of those things are not once in your calendar, which I have seen because I actually do <laughs> actually have helped uh, <laughs> Felicity and some of her admin work and we continue to strive forward and move Pitchball's pace. Just a little plug for the business uh, for personal one-on-one -on -one coaching online or one-on-one -on -one in a studio in Sydney. Uh, but the exciting thing is that I think when I'm learning, I'm learning from somebody that's actually in the field as well. Um, have you just naturally sort of progressed from the dance, found voice teaching and then acting was always there as well and voiceovers just became a part of your toolbox? 
I, I, that's a really good question because I think a lot of people might um, have a lot of questions about me as an artist and like, well, what are you? You know, you're not famous, but yet you've been around forever. And yeah. and what are you really? And where was your training really? You know, you're not a night grad and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting questions about me as an artist. I guess the easiest thing is I was a child actor. And I, I say child actor, not child star. My brother was a child star and my mother was a child star. I was a child actor. And the distinction there is that I wasn't very well known, but I did work. And I think I've kind of continued on that trajectory, which is that I've just always done lots of small roles in lots of different little things. And um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, one is that my brother looked like Macaulay Culkin at the time when Home Alone came out. Wow. So he was in the right place at the right time and also was gifted. So, you know, whereas I looked like pretty much like this at six, <laughs> which was just a little bit different and a bit kind of oldie worldy and 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 so there were certain types I just didn't fit the commercial model if that makes sense yeah right you know, yep. I wasn't a bad looking kid but I wasn't like you know super cute either I was just a, a good a good little kid you know I was ordinary um and so I think for that reason I never really sort of you know got to any sort of level I was always on hold for stuff you know, it's second choice for the Shirley and I was second choice for this and second choice for that. I did do a couple of really amazing roles as a kid, actually. I worked opposite Melita Jurisic. Um, I just have so much admiration for her and what she's done with her with her career and her outlook on life and I love her. Um, but I had the chance of working with her when she just graduated from NIDA and um, so that was in a core cast role. So that was when I was only eight. So I've had a very unusual life and also my mother being an actress, my grandmother being an actress, it was kind of more like a family trade, but it was very clear to me that I needed to study. So I was a bit of a bookworm, which is where the voiceovers come in. So to answer your other part of the question, I was yeah. always yeah. reading. And it was actually my agent, my childhood agent, Carolyn White, who um, said, I think you should do voiceovers. And I, you know, I was only like 10. And so I went into the ABC radio and just read copious amounts of um, poetry on the radio. Um, with, at 10. Um, you're sorry? At, at 10. You, you were 10. Yeah. And oh, wow. Yeah. Like nice. extensive text. And that's actually what I was doing today. So I just went in and read a novel today in the studio. Um, I'm going back in again tomorrow. And then tonight I've got an audition for something. And um, yeah, I've got a, an amazing voiceover agent. I'm with Scout Management. They are wonderful. I love them. Catherine and Heidi, hello. Um, I'm so lucky. And, I, you know, I've had lots of different agents help me along the way in London. And this was probably more to your question, is I went through a real period of soul searching in my personal life. In about 2005, I broke up with a fiancé who I was completely in love with. And um, it was a very hard thing to end because we had such a firm friendship as well as a life friendship and we did everything together. We were plays, we were in everything together. Yeah. And um, eventually, and he actually suggested to me, he said, why don't you write that show? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, write that show. And I'm so grateful to him, Jason, because basically what I did was I went and I wrote the solo show and it was about my grandmother's life. And it was about her as a voice coach and as a mother. And she'd been through so much. And I realized by writing her show, it was not, possible to do it factually because she told one story on the tape and she told a different story when she wrote it down and then she told me a different story in person and I thought it's slightly different each time and my mum said oh she's always making it up as she goes along <laughs> and I thought I thought well how can I give justice to this so I wrote this show in part to heal myself mm -hmm. because I was feeling sorry for myself you know I was 29 and I'd split up with at that point the love of my life and I didn't know what I was doing and I thought I'm going to write a show because that's my language and it was a tribute to my grandmother to say thank you and um, as it happened I got a theatre in New York off Broadway and as it happened I ended up being an assistant director to Marshall Napier at the same time and you know it was all this interesting fate and then I did a film which was also on in Cannes at that so I just had like all these things happen and it kind of all just came together and I ended up in London in an off West End theatre that I paid for myself, which um, I spent a long time paying off. And, <laughs> and so then I ended up in London. But what was really interesting is that the story was about my grandmother. So I never wrote it with a purpose of 
anything other than love. It was a tribute to her. And it was a way of me saying thank you for all of the voice training, acting training, free theatre tickets, um, introducing me to John Milliken and Angie, uh, sorry, Angie Milliken and John Bell and people like these incredible actors wow. and me always hiding behind her. And I would always say, Grandma, stop it. It's really embarrassing. You mustn't do that. They don't want to meet me. Just, just you go. And I, I tell her off. And she's like, just come here. My granddaughter. Come. And I was so embarrassed by her, honestly. But this show was my, because I'm actually quite shy. So this is the other thing about me. I've got this kind of public face, but this, we've all got public and private faces, don't we? Absolutely. But, um, but I was very shy um, about, you know, like I didn't want to be a pain. And uh, I was embarrassed by this part of my grandmother who just used to push me out there before I was ready. Yeah. And uh, I think I was also conscious that I wasn't properly trained and all that sort of thing. And so I had such reverence and such, you know, honour to people like John Bell. And, you know, I did work experience with John. I was so lucky. And so I've had some amazing experiences in my life, but I wanted it to be my own. I wanted to earn my place. Yes. And so that show was my way of saying thank you. And what happened at the end of that show was that I sent one tape to one agent on a whim with a review. And I thought, oh, well, well, he called me <laughs> and he said, do you want a job? And I said, ah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you want a job? Not do you want representation? Said, do you want a job? And he said, right. Exactly. And he said, I won't represent you. And I said, okay. Oh. And he goes, but do you want the job anyway? And I went, all right. <laughs> and so that's how my voiceover career started in London. And I didn't stop working. And it was him every time. And, and even before I left London, he sends me a Christmas card every year, even though he's Jewish. And he, he I love him dearly. And uh, he, he said to me, oh, yes, um, uh, can I just ask Felicity, um, do you have an agent yet? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've got another voiceover agent. He goes, right, because I'm still sending you for stuff. And I said, oh, that's fine. I said, I've talked to him about it. So I had two voice agents, but only one rep. It was, this, it was bizarre. Yeah. Stuff. But that's kind of how it happened. It, it, all of my voiceover work really came from love. It came from my love of words, my love of literature, my love of... Um, sounds like a bad quote from the history boys of what you should never say about literature but it, you know if you know that quote <laughs> you'll say oh, you know love literature but uh, yeah so it was kind of for me it was really about coming back to what my first point of the imagination was which as, as a little girl I used to read to myself and I would sing songs in the backyard and make up stories like every other kid, I suppose, you know, it wasn't anything special, but that was just my way in. My way in was reading. Yeah. And, um, and I'm just lucky. I was lucky. I used to read phonetics books when I was four because I was a little nerd, you know, I was very teased at school, you know, they used to call me Felicity nerd. Um, well, look at this wonderful so, nerd that has blossomed into a, a glorious, um, a beautiful mum, a beautiful friend to so many different people and a, an incredible teacher um, on on and off of voice classes or whatever it is. I think you you do offer a lot to people, um, even through Zoom, I'm still feeling that wonderful energy that you have. Um, now, I think a bunch I'll of people- still can... be, I'll still be getting, you know, I'll be like, someone will be running in for your signature in a minute. I mean, <laughs> this is the other thing about you, Stephen, is you just have this, a beautiful warm energy you make everybody feel comfortable I mean I don't think I've ever shared that story with anyone but um and I have to do just a very big shout out to you too because you do a lot of service for other artists and I just want to take this moment to say thank you because I actually don't know how I would have made it through last year without Stephen because you honestly I was you know in a th and you saw my calendar I was in a thousand different places and I still remember there was one day where I was getting you to book spaces while I was marking assessments and I had a one hour deadline and I had an audition and I needed to pick up my son and it, I couldn't have done that and several other days like that without you so thank you thank thank you uh, it's a pleasure to do it's a pleasure to do business with you, but it's an absolute pleasure to be able to um, bring you onto my show and share just a very small part. Obviously, we could talk for hours about lots of different <laughs> things, and we do. We will probably when we get offline. But um, where can people find uh, Pitch Pause Pace? Right. So I share a lot of free tips and resources that people might be interested in. It's um, I believe in you know education being available to all. 
you might find it comes at a level that you it's a bit complex that's okay you can go just find something else on the page but um it's all there if you want to have a look there's lots of resources book recommendations exercises i tend not to add many videos although i did get pressured by people recently to put up some videos so i did a couple um uh i know there are other voice teachers out there so it's just take what you what you feel is useful from my work yes and remember that it's derivative um, I have to give honour to Emily Kagan. It was her anniversary of her passing yesterday. Um, so it's really interesting that you asked me yesterday because that was the work that I've shared with you. Um, she's a very, very special lady and so many great voice teachers out there. Juliet Jordan, without whom I wouldn't have had my voiceover career. So a lot of the work that's on my page, just be conscious that it is actually derivative of other people's work, but it's pitch, pause, pace. And um, that's my little business name and that just describes um, the kind of work that I do with public speaking um, actors. I work with corporate um, and uh, beginners and, and experienced. I even work with some very, very experienced actors. I've just recently helped two actors get roles in, in one in a play, one in a film, which I'm very excited about. So, but yeah, you can check out Instagram or Facebook. There's lots of information out there, or you can go to my website if you want to have a little look on the different sort of different types of people that I've trained. Fantastic. And I'll put those in the notes of this video. Uh, everyone watching and listening, thank you very much for joining on this show called That Show with Mahi. Uh, thank you once again, Felicity. You're amazing, Stephen. Thank you for having me. And um, I'm really loving seeing all the guests I've been watching and they've been very inspiring and reminding me I need to do my home workout. I've got my Pilates thing on my wall. I yeah. just need to force myself to do it. So get there. Stay fit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye.